Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Championship Check-In Podcast. We did it, Sam. We got we got through Christmas. I've just dropped little Enid off at the Childminder, and my routine can continue as per normal now. Um, bit of housekeeping first before we hear from Mr. Parkin. So, again, we're pre-recorded. We apologise to the people who love the live chat. We love the live chat, too. We will be back to normal next week. And of course, because it's FA Cup this weekend, we're going to do something a little bit special for you um, halfway through the show instead of the normal um, predictions um, type affair. And that will be split over two separate YouTube videos, but you can get it on the audio early on. Happy New Year, Sam. It felt felt really crammed this year with the match being on the 23rd. The, like the gap was between the 16th and the 23rd, and then it was just family football, family football, family football for two weeks in a row. I feel absolutely exhausted. I probably look at two. How is it for you? Yeah, happy new year, mate. Uh, it's been good. I think, yeah, like when I was a player, you get through all the Christmas fixtures, all the games, and then you're kind of desperate for a night out when everyone's done in. Do you know what I mean? And I've got that yeah. same kind of sentiment now. Not so much a night out, but I need a holiday now. And everyone's <laughs> just had their holiday. Do you know what I mean? So you're always How long ago at... were you in France at your dad's? That's not a holiday, mate. <laughs> Believe you me. Um, but you're always a little bit out of sync as a player. I remember when you got to like the 2nd of January, I'm like that, right, desperate for a beer, <laughs> desperate for a night out. And my mates are like, we've been out for three weeks. We're like, I'm not drinking in January. So I feel oh. a little bit like that at the moment. So me and um, the other half are going away for a night tomorrow. Um, believe it or not, to have a little bit of rest and recuperation after Beautiful. basically just loads of football <laughs> <laughs> and and children um, waking us up at five in the morning. Oh, mate. Um, so what we're going to do, we would normally rattle through the results, but essentially there's been four rounds in nine days since we've done a proper pod. So, Sam, I'm going to rattle through the table. We're going to give you the kind of headlines. And if there's anything you want to mention that might not be Parkins pick. You can touch on that a little bit to start the show. So at the top, I am now really genuinely believing, having seen them in the flesh again, that Leicester are probably going to score more than 106 points and break the record this season. They're 10 points clear now of Ipswich in second, 13 clear of Southampton. But let's not gloss over that because Southampton have closed the gap on Ipswich up to three points. And that was 10 not so long ago. It's 42 and 52. Uh, so basically the last 10 points for Southampton have come with only three points landing in for Ipswich. And uh, Leeds were level with Southampton and they are now four points behind. So all a bit different at the top. We still got West Brom in fifth. Harlan Sunderland have swapped. Mick Beal's got seven points in the last three games. And hello, who's that up in eighth? Coventry have jumped six places uh, from 14th over the last four games. Cardiff is still hanging in there. Watford, Bristol City, Middlesbrough, Norwich, Preston, Sam are our big losers. They dropped from eighth. In fact, I think they've essentially swapped places with Coventry over the last four games. Millwall up in 15th. Swansea still without a manager. Blackburn, huge drop off from them. Look at that. Um, one point in the last five games up on the form table there. Plymouth still without a manager. Stoke still 19th. Birmingham. Maybe the subject of one of our segments today, Sam. Huddersfield still in 21st. And at the bottom, um, it's a lot closer than it has been now. Sheffield Wednesday, only three points off Huddersfield. Uh, QPR, bit of a drop off after their splurge. And Rotherham, maybe a little bit of hope now given to them with five points in three games from Liam Richardson. Still a hell of a lot to do, but they're a hell of a lot closer than they were. Um, anything you want to pick out from that league table, Sam? Before we go to Parkins' pick, I wind you back up to the top half. Mm. Uh, well, I think New Year's Day, the, the big movers were Coventry, which which you've mentioned. More on them later. This is an incredible run. Just one defeat in 11 games at, at Ipswich. So definitely worth mentioning them. In terms of big winners again from New Year's Day, Leeds, I suppose, with the other teams around them dropping points. Got to mention Southampton in terms of the last, what, Two or three 18. months, 18 games now. I was down there for the the win over Plymouth. Obviously, that, that flattered 
uh, Argyle a little bit. Uh, they were very good again, Southampton. So definitely worth mentioning them. I thought, actually, another team that's unfortunate, two teams unfortunate not to be Parkins pick this week. So I'll let the cat out of the bag now. Swansea. I thought that was the shock result of New Year's Day, beating West Bromwich Albion on the back of a really good point at Coventry. Last minute. I feel like he's going to get the job, though, Alan Sheehan, does it? Not really, no. No. Um, Obviously, they went for the guy from Tottenham, didn't they? They, I think he turned it down, didn't he? Davis, I think, is the the chap's name. Uh, And Sheffield Wednesday with the other team, Ben, that are really unfortunate not to be talked about in greater detail today. Uh, Two enormous victories, obviously helped by the early red card against Hull City. But Danny Roll just continues to impress this is I would say not a relegation side now can they continue I suppose in the same vein and accumulate enough points to stay in the division he's certainly not a a manager who uh, Sam, they've won, since December the 2nd Sam they've won five games mm. yeah and I think the biggest compliment we can give them is that even in defeat in the the early weeks of his tenure, you could immediately see the improvement. So, I mean, nothing would surprise me really in in terms of the bottom three at the moment. I think any one of them, QPR need a bit of help in the window. Um, Rotherham improved, definitely worth mentioning them now, but it would not surprise me any one of those three surviving now, which is a hell of a shout. Rotherham would still be the, um, the outlier of those three, but yeah, vast improvements across all three clubs and performances recently. QPR need goals, don't they? But um, they have, have certainly improved in the early weeks under Sifuentes. You've probably figured it out by process of deduction now. Let's go to hmm. Parkins' pick. We've got to talk about a of a turnaround for Millwall and Joe Edwards. Um, if you take just the four games from the 23rd, Sam, no goals conceded. Three straight wins now coming into January and 10 points on the board. They've gone from being two above relegation to 10 above relegation. How has Joe mm-hmm. Edwards masterminded this and why a Millwall Parkins pick? Well, they're only just pipping Sheffield Wednesday. I've got to say that again. Um, yeah, it's been an incredible turnaround. Seven without a win after that 3-0 thumping of, of Sheffield Wednesday and six without a clean sheet until this brilliant little run. What, four without conceding now? I don't think it's a coincidence that Sarkic has come back in, in goal. Bialkowski, I'm sure you're a big fan, Ben, and he's not a bad goalkeeper. But just quickly, Bialkowski, 21 conceded in 14 games. Sarkic has conceded 10 in 12 games, six of those against Leicester and Norwich. So in the other 10 games, he's conceded four goals, Sarkic. So I think he's been a really impressive signing. So I think it's important to mention him. But collectively, and this is where I'm a little bit surprised, I suppose, when I, I saw Joe Edwards. Um, link with a job and and obviously getting the gig, I anticipated it being an appointment to improve them offensively and to make them more easy on the eye and and maybe to introduce a, an extra forward player. Well, actually, and whether he's had to change and revert to type a little bit, this is a Millwall team quite similar to the previous guys is where they are very much built on strong foundations at the moment, solid defence. Missed hard in the other day at Bristol City. Hutchinson comes back in after being on the periphery, really. Scores his first goal in 74 games and and what a goal it was. But I I thought they played well in the second half at Bristol City. I don't think that the home fans can have too many complaints. And Joe Edwards has certainly made them really resolute, hard to beat. Just on that point, Sam, you're totally right. I just looked at the XG against... For all those last three games, 0.48, 0.49, 0.59. They're not giving up any chances. And that surely that's just good management, isn't it? You see where you are. You've got your philosophy. It's not quite working before you get to your first transfer window. You've got to do, you've got to do what you've got to do, haven't you? Yeah, and we're going to talk about another club at the forefront of my mind today and, <laughs> and yesterday. 
who are suffering from maybe trying to change too quickly. Well, I, I, I still see remnants of what Joe Edwards wants to do. And at times they are playing through the thirds and playing out from the back to a degree. So I don't think this is, you know, someone who's gone in there and just, you know, trying to just not really give anything away defensively and be very similar to the previous managers. I think there are little small changes. Look at Honeyman playing in midfield. I mean, he's been a revelation in the last few games and the prospect of the Noor coming back alongside him, that's a real exciting area to pitch for them. Yes, they'll want to be better with the ball. And I thought they were for periods against Norwich. But when you look at the possession statistics against QPR, Norwich and Bristol City, they're not really having much of the ball at all. So that's what he'll try and evolve as they get better players uh, through the door and, and into the club over the, the transfer window and, and next summer. But in terms of where they were, this has been a yeah brilliant month for, for Joe Edwards and Millwall. Outstanding stuff. And tell me yes or no, Sam. I didn't see it coming. Did you see this little run coming? No, because, you know, I do I do a lot of games in London and I speak to a lot of people who cover Millwall and they were, you know, questioning the appointment probably, you know, before this little run of games. I don't think there'd been much change. Um, and I think the Millwall supporters probably anticipated them sleeping towards, uh, sleepwalking towards trouble. So, yeah, it's been a timely turnaround. Well played, Joe Edwards. Well played, Millwall. They're Parkins pick. Let's move on to the Worldie of the Week. So, we've missed doing these, haven't we? We're not going to cover the entirety of Christmas, Sam, are we? But you definitely, I mean, there's a real standout contender. Um, there's definitely a lovely goal in round um, what is it, 26 that we've just had that you'd love to talk about, Sam. Yeah, very unique goal, I would say, this one. And uh, as a collection, there's two teams who scored three stupendous goals. So, I'll just mention them again. Sheffield Wednesday. Uh, it feels like I owe Sheffield Wednesday a bit of a favour. You bloody love Sheffield them. Wednesday this week. But, don't you? but, well, yeah, they scored three great goals, but against uh, 10 men whole. But the Argyle goals, the three of them against Watford. That Whittaker, was Hard Plymouth, wasn't it? <laughs> yeah, Whitaker, Hardy, and obviously my goal of the week, the world of the week, Finn Azaz, um, who is having a brilliant little spell. He's been playing, actually... Under the interim managers, if I'm allowed to call them that, because I know one's the director of football, he's been playing off the left-hand side in some of these games, forward left-hand side, kind of where Mumbers occupied, um, if you like. But they played a three at times, Mumbers played wing-back. So in a 3-4-3, three, three, Azaz has been kind of tucked in off the left-hand side, but irrelevant of his position. Uh, everyone would have seen this goal by now. A corner cleared, so about the edge of the box, and it's a side-foot volley. And it is. Well, can we just can we just get beautiful. your technical opinion on this then, Sam? So this is coming down at such a speed that mm. he can't lace it, can he? He's too close to the ball. So what's the thought process then? Is is that literally the only finish on the card without taking a touch, maybe on his thigh and then hitting mm. it? Is that is that the thought process? This is all I've got here. I've got to yeah. hoist my right foot up and cushion it. I think it's probably more about the trajectory, isn't it? If you're letting it drop a little bit, it's probably hard to get it up and down over the goalkeeper. So it's just feel. It's it's. I remember scoring one in, in uh, school football like it. You know, when you just catch it, because it's such a difficult skill, I think, on the volley to get the right contact on that with the side foot. It's got to be kind of, um, it's got to be struck clean enough to, to get it beyond the goalkeeper. But I well, think it's going to be no pace of... on it, Sam, is there? If it's floating, you've got to position it perfectly as well. Yeah. You? Yeah. So it's more about the placement, but also the the amount of loft you kind of get on it. It's, yeah, it's beautifully timed. He's a very elegant footballer, I would say, really capable of doing this type of thing. So he's having a, he's having a real good time at the moment. He would probably be in my consideration for the conversation we're going to have later on, actually, in the in the show. Um, but, yeah, that, that was the standout goal of the, the week. Uh, and that, that tech, just from your player's point of view again, Sam, that technique is not normally used for shooting. It's normally used if you're going to loft the ball over the back line 
in in behind to, yeah. for someone to run onto, yeah? Yeah, or maybe, yeah, or just playing it into someone's feet, maybe playing it into the space. So, yeah, very unusual technique, but a brilliant goal. I think, you know, harder skill to execute than that of uh, Whitaker's finish, uh, Ryan Hardy's finish. Windass at Sheffield Wednesday's was a really good one. Uh, is it Gasama, the other Sheffield Wednesday player, cutting in from the left, scored a brilliant goal. Watford scored some peaches, actually, in that game. But in terms of the difficulty of the the execution, Finners as by, by streets. OK, let's lower the tone then from a beautiful goal by Finn and Zaz. And we're going to have our weekly wrestle with time to explain Blackburn Rovers. So as you've already figured out, Blackburn are our cause for concern. And we struggle with Blackburn, don't we? Because we both seem to be fans of John Dell Thomas, and I think that would be right to say. We like their attacking setup. We get rather confused by the fact that they never draw, um, and thus they become a bit streaky at times during the season. And we're having one of these streaks now, Sam. I've just got the last five games up there. OK, 4-0 loss at Southampton. Everyone's losing to Southampton at the moment. Uh, but then home defeat to Watford. 3-0 defeat at Huddersfield is an odd one. Um, they lost to Hull, and Hull have not been in form. I think that's the only game Hull won over the Christmas period. And then you're at home to Rotherham, and we've all loved to Rotherham. That's one you're at home to the bottom place team is essentially the easiest game you can have on paper, giving up a lead in that. And if I wind back, there is a victory there against Bristol City, and then you've got a defeat at Sheffield Wednesday or down the bottom as well, and OK, Leeds are a parachute team as well. Can you unpick this, um, Sam, in terms of this latest Blackburn streak, which has dropped them all the way down to 17? Yeah, I think it's probably important to say that the performance for maybe 45 minutes an hour against Rotherham should have, should have yielded the, the three points. I think it was a case of defensive errors again, uh, in part uh, another goalkeeping error and, and missed chances at the other end. So that result could have been different, but that said, Six defeats in eight um, makes for really poor reading. Six points from their last eight games. That's the fewest level with, with Birmingham over that period. So they're the joint worst team over the last eight games in the division. And I think, yeah, it's a lot of it is about the defensive woes. Um, the goalkeeper, Wolstead, you could argue, has been at fault for a goal in each of the last four games. And now we're talking about a defence that has shipped 48 goals. Only Rotherham have conceded more. So the, the, the problems clearly lie defensively. They've somehow been able to get away with losing Brereton Diaz and not replacing him because Sammy Schmodix is having the season of a, of a lifetime. His points have won, his goals have won 10 points alone. His 16 goals and and three assists has been a, a revelation for them. But it is just feast or famine, isn't it? You know, only two draws again this season. The goal scorers that were supposedly brought in to replace what Brereton Diaz was was supplying have not scored a goal between them. I'm talking about Ennis and Telelovic, who, who's come in for the last couple of games. So I'm sure they'll still look to add probably a a proven central striker. So Smodix can maybe re revert to playing on the left-hand side or playing in, in the 10, which he's done at, at times this season. But um, yeah, I, I think it would be a miss of us to ignore this. Four straight defeats on the road as well. I think they've conceded 13 goals during that run. And that was on the back of a run where they'd won four consecutive <laughs> games on the road. So it's very difficult to get your head around, but when you watch the little snippets that are coming out of Ewood Park in terms of John Dahl Thomason's pre-match and post-match interviews, he is being asked the hard questions, the direct questions about not necessarily his future, but why it's going so horribly wrong at the moment. And I probably don't remember the scrutiny being this strong on him. And still, like you said at the top, he gets linked with a lot of jobs when like they're good. It, yeah. They're brilliant on the eye, but they are, I suppose, a really good footballing team going one way, 
going the other way at the moment. You know, they're they're miles away from being a challenger this year. What seventeenth in the table? Mm. That's a that's a big drop off from last year. So I don't think there's the budget to probably go and do too much in January. I think this is a big part of the problem. And I think when you're looking at the recruitment as well, it's um, it's Broughton that's in charge there, isn't it? I actually know him a little bit. He was at, he was at Luton previously and I, I, I knew his brother as well. But I think, you know, you could maybe question probably how much he's been backed, but also some of the signings that they've they've made. Um, so I'm not saying they're going to get themselves into trouble this year, but I think it's right that we highlight that this has been a, a terrible run. Sam, when you look at numbers and you see a team who's not actually conceding that many chances, but conceding loads of goals, my mm. brain immediately goes, well, that's either bad luck or there's something systematic with the type of chance you concede or some... Fragility. Why? Why would a team? I just looked at those last three games where they've conceded eight goals. Um, they're pretty much conceding every ch- conceding a goal on most of the chances they they give they're giving up. I can't put my finger on it. The goalkeeper's not having a good time. I think is the obvious place to start. Um, I think only one team have conceded more set piece goals as well, which shows that they've got a. A deficiency there. I think it's Watford with with eleven. Um, they've conceded ten, and we know that there's a there's a mental block. I would suggest when they go behind in games. Um, you know that's why they don't they don't draw any games. It was certainly the case last year. So whether there's not enough characters, there's a character flaw within the group. You know, there's always something in it. If there's a team who are reoccurringly coming from behind and winning games and taking points, you know, absolutely. That trait is, is so such a positive for any side. So I I think Blackburn lack that, whether it's um, a bit of experience injuries as well at the moment, Dominic Hyam, uh, ranking Costello. I think there's two or three more as well. So there's maybe mitigating circumstances, but I think when a team's missing probably a few of the bigger characters, the more experienced guys, in such a youthful squad, that can be another ingredient as well. And as soon as you said experience, I just thought oh, Lenahan out the door, Rockwell out the door, Diaz out the door, Dak out the door. So a lot of personalities have gone and you, you take time to build that back up, doesn't it? Right. I feel a rank coming on, Sam. It's time for our meltdown moment. Right, we're going to talk about Birmingham City, but let's try and make this a purposeful and useful conversation, Sam, because we're seeing a lot of people who are just kind of old man yells at cloud. We yeah. get it. This has gone terribly. It was a bad call. They've messed it up. So um, what I'm most interested in your take on, Sam, is what could Wayne Rooney have done differently mm. and what the hell to Birmingham do now, A, for their supporters not to think that their higher-ups are not fit for purpose and a bunch of buffoons, basically, and in terms of what's what's the right person to put into quite mm-hmm. a volatile situation? Hmm. Come on, mate. That's, that's put me on the spot. Um, what should he have done is focused on what they were doing right especially in those previous couple of games, focused in on that and then made little minor adjustments here and there. Got his staff, Ashley Cole, improving the young players, working with Buchanan and and, and Laird, the fullbacks, um, maybe introducing that one extra forward player or that extra pass in the final third or when the opponent drops off and... There's a little bit of space and they're anticipating John Roddy playing into the final third. Then maybe he could have given it to one of their better ball players who went and received it. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm a bit tired of this. He, you know, he's tried, and I, I've been guilty of saying it, he's tried to play a too sophisticated brand for the players that he's got at his disposal. But, but Sam, sorry, can I jump in there? You're dead right. It's nothing to do with the type of football he wanted to play, 
I totally agree with you. It's the implementation of ideas too fast and mm. not in a more methodical way, isn't it? Right. It doesn't matter what what mm. style you're transitioning from one to. That's got to be done so cleverly. And once you've gone all in, the toothpaste's out of the tube and it ain't ain't going back in, is it? Yeah, I mean, an example of what the previous manager, John Eustace, did is he he, he made some good signings, you know, Laird and those Buchanan, the fullback areas really needed strength. And, you know, for me, that's someone who's trying to improve the brand, trying to improve the excitement, trying to give you more threats. Stansfield, I wouldn't say that Stansfield's a Birmingham player, really, from the last five or six years. I'd say that have been quite hard to get him in. He's a bit of a luxury, I would say. He does work hard but he's a bit of a floater, kind of in between the lines, an exciting talent. So, yeah, I, I, I would say that Eusty was kind of doing that. One point I would make, and just to contradict myself a little bit, <laughs> I was on Five Live with Steve Cottrell on New Year's Day, former Birmingham manager, of course, who I think, you know, memory's a bit hazy, but I think he had a pretty wretched time there um, listening to him the other day and spoke about the troubles with the ownership. But I asked him a question because... I, I had my own feeling about this and I said to him, right, you're wanting to, you, you're um, inheriting the squad. You want to play out from the back, right? Nine times out of 10. What are the most fundamental things you have in that squad in terms of the individuals? What do you need to be able to execute that? And I had my own feeling about what Birmingham do and don't have. And he said, goalkeeper, one of your centre halves and your, your number six, I think six, he referred to. Yeah, 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 okay, yeah. so straight away, I would say that Birmingham don't have anyone in those aforementioned positions to play that properly, seamlessly. And that was so obvious to me uh, when this when this change happened. And it's been so obvious to me watching Birmingham in the early weeks of the, the season. So there it is in a nutshell. Um, is and he 13 didn't games. Do what Joe Edwards did of going, oh, okay, this isn't working out. I'm going to pivot, pivot back. Sorry, continue, Sam. No, 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 no. That's, that's, yeah, absolutely. And, and it's maybe only now that we've seen Mill over the last couple of weeks that that's become, you know, kind of evident and, uh, and obviously standing out to us. But, um, yeah, I, ju I just think, he tried to close a couple of games down, didn't he? he? Tried to close that game down against Bristol City and did quite well. Um, they didn't concede much on the goal, the nil-nil. And then for half an hour against Leeds, the back three, back five um, worked quite well. But when the first one went in, um, certainly the second one, they just absolutely folded. So I think he'd maybe tried to just pull the reins in a little bit the last couple of games and maybe just admit that maybe the solidity of the team is is the um the strongest suit but um i think the atmosphere at ellen road i mean you got some almighty grief from the home fans i'm led to believe <laughs> but the toxicity coming from the away end his manner at the end of the game i heard his his post match he he sounded like a beaten man um and i i don't know this is a guy who for his entire career is used to winning as well this is not psychologically he Played for Man United the whole time, and as England's record goal, well, was England's record goal scorer. Do you know what I mean? It it felt like this is something new to him, not winning all that. I suppose he was Derby, wasn't he? And MLS, but that, I always thought that about his manner, Sam, that he's used to this level of excellence and struggling to cope with um, with it not being there. Yeah, quite possibly. I, I... I don't know. There's been has there been any positives? I suppose Jordan James, Jordan James, isn't it? His performances. Romel Donovan getting a few minutes. I think Stansfield's form has been quite good. And there's obviously the risk of of losing him now if we're led to believe some of the um some of the, the noise and some of the articles we've been seeing. Um the red card for for Bielik, I suppose, didn't do him any favours at, at Plymouth either. I mean, I'm scratching around here a little bit, but it just, you know, feels to me that someone's come in from the cold, probably not with the greatest knowledge of the championship, the current championship, not the greatest knowledge of the squad. And been said to to play a team in a style that they're they're no clearly not ready for. Yeah. So where they go now? Um, I've seen Steve Cooper mentioned this morning. Ooh. I mean, that would be an in incredible get if they could get him. Um, he'd be. Well, can I can I challenge you on that? Can can they get him? Because um, I I tweeted when Cooper went out of 
Forest. Oh, there'll be a few of championship clubs, but every championship club wants Steve Cooper after what he did at Forest. And I got a lot of replies, maybe reasonably saying, oh, Ben, he's not going to drop back down. He's going to wait for the Premier League job. Uh, I'd be very surprised, very surprised if they were able to get him. But I suppose they can dangle a few quid at him. The, the potential is clearly there. He's about to have a window as well. It's whether he'd he'd want to drop back into the championship, I suppose, uh, when he's proved he himself. In the championship as well. Yeah. I, I don't think if he went in there, there'd be any worries about, you know, dropping further at all. I think he'd sort them out. Um, I don't think they'd steam up the table, but I think they'd, they'd finish well away from, from trouble and maybe well into the top half. I think he'd be that comfortable in another championship role. But... <sighs> I don't know. It would be strange because he seems like a man of real principle. And not to say that going into Birmingham wouldn't be an attractive proposition because this is these are you know, these are owners that have got real ambition. They seem to be on a solid foundation for the first time in years. So absolutely people will be jumping at the opportunity to manage that club. But I think Steve Cooper's probably deserved the right to to get himself another Premier League job right now. Yeah, I think I'm kind of there. It would be look, we'll we'll wrap up on Birmingham because we've got plenty else to talk about. And I dare say, um, by the time we're speaking again next week, Sam, we'll have the answer and we don't need to we don't need to speculate. Although uh, given how long Swansea um and Plymouth are taking, maybe we maybe we won't have the answer. Um now we're gonna go to our fun segment in just a minute. We've just got a couple more things to do. We would normally do a player to watch. Um, in anticipation of the next run of games. But we're going to do our December dream, our Christmas cracker, and just give a shout out to a player who's had a very good last month. And Sam, you would like to talk about Tatsuhiro Sakamoto. And what I love about this player, Sam, is he passes the Ben's misses test, right? And this, this is an important test, right? If you take, if I take my missus to the football, um, she doesn't notice the small nuances. She notices the blatant things. So when I took her to watch Chipswich, she'd go, oh, he's fun. And it was David McGoldrick. He picks out all the really skillful players. If I took her to see Coventry and the ball switched play and Sakamoto can kill it and then did a little dribble and a sidestep, she'd go, he's good, isn't he? That, that guy out there. So... Um, regardless of her um, him passing the my missus test for the the eye test for a layman's a lay woman's um, good footballer, um, this is a player we were quite excited about when we first saw him, and he's nailed December, hasn't he? Yeah, he's been in inc- incredible form. Um, this is a player who'd only scored one goal in his first fifteen appearances, I think, uh, in the, in a championship for Coventry. So yeah, he he's banging form in a minute. Uh, at the minute, sorry, eight goal involvements for the season, seven goal involvements in the last seven, five goals and and two assists. And I'll take you back to that balmy August evening, I think it yeah. was, at AFC Wimbledon, where I saw him and Hadji Wright in the flesh, in the infancy of their Coventry careers. And there was so much to like about both of them. They lost the game that night. They missed chances. But Sakamoto... There's a bit of the Mares about him. There's a bit of the Messi about him in terms of his stature. All left foot. Uh, there's a touch. bit of Wes Houlihan, maybe. There's someone who I just can't quite get the comparison to, but he does remind me of someone. But he's got that lovely low centre of, center of gravity, beautiful left foot, drop of a shoulder. and this changing Forrest, is that who you're thinking of? Who, sorry? John Robertson, play on the right wing, oh. low centre of gravity, jink, and then cross with the left foot. We're going, we're going back my, to the late 70s. A bit there, before though. my time, that, mate. Um, yeah. No, I just think, and I was just going to say, the changing system that Mark Robbins has recently done, The he's kind of a, a 4-1-4-1, if you like, 4-3-3, but he's got um, Callum O'Hare playing centrally off um, the centre forward and right's on the left-hand side, and, and Sakamoto's over there on the... Um, on the right hand side, and that relationship between him and uh, Milan Van Eric as well seems to be developing on that that flank, which is, you know, really good for their prospects. And what is it? Unbeaten in seven, one defeat in eleven. The big movers in the division, the one that Steve Cottrell was quite hot on the other day when we were 
chatting about a team coming from deep and um, Sakamoto all of a sudden is um, getting the goals, getting the assists. His numbers are backing up what was um, yeah, a really encouraging first, first week, few weeks at Coventry. So, yeah, really enjoying watching him. It's interesting you talk about a team coming from deep because to me, that team was going to be Middlesbrough and at the weekend, Coventry went to Middlesbrough, won and, you know, maybe in my in my brain that debunks one and puts me towards towards the other um right we're going to do a little update of the predictions how we got on and then we will get to our team of the season so far so stan there's good news and bad news here um tell us about the um how we got on in the last round of predictions yeah, I would hazard a guess that this was probably the best week we've we've both had. I won't bore everyone because it's a bit self-indulgent, <laughs> yeah. but basically <laughs> we went in, uh, the scores were, uh, I don't think I've got it in front of me, I could work it out. The scores were 32 to me, 33 to you. So you had a point advantage before this round. And um, I actually got six results right. Six you're pretty, results. You're pretty consistent with getting half the outcomes right, aren't you? Yeah, six results right, but just two scores bang on. So I got Huddersfield, Middlesbrough, uh, bang on, 2-1 away win. And I got Millwall to beat Norwich, 1-0, bang on as well. I predicted the outcome of Southampton, Plymouth, Preston, Sheffield Wednesday, Cardiff against Leicester and West Brom against Leeds. So anyway, I got a grand total of 10 points. You but predicted West Brom to beat Leeds? I predicted West Brom to beat Leeds, yeah. You should get a bonus point for that. It's a great shout. Um, I think I went 2-1, though, and it was 1-0. Anyway, you got 11 points. You got Southampton, Plymouth, bang on, 2-1. You got Watford against Stoke, bang on, 1-1. And the piece of the resistance, if that's the correct <laughs> phrase. this one. You got three points plus your bonus point for predicting that Hull were going to beat Blackburn 3 2, which was. I mean, that is outstanding. Even you've got that, that's a hell of a prediction, isn't it? So, even you've got to admit that, mate, haven't you? So, a long story short, that's magnificent. You got 11 points. I got 10, courtesy of all those results I got a spot on, leaving the scores at Ben 44, Sam 42. You've extended oh. your lead by a point. It's, it's outstanding um, and it's great fun for us to do. Obviously, no predictions um, coming up this round. Um, and so, a little bit of housekeeping again. We are now going to do what Cara and Nev, we're going to do our best impressions here, did on Monday Night Football or whatever day of the week it is when this one added the team of the season so far. If you're watching on YouTube, this show is about to finish. You'll be watching it on Thursday, I hope. And you'll be able to watch the predictions. Oh, predictions, idiot. You, I've, I've done so well setting up, Sam, as well. Though. You'll be able to watch the team of the season segment the following day, which will be on the Friday, the 5th. If you're listening on audio, keep on rolling because you're about to hear our team of the season so far. <laughs> <laughs> 